My name is Richard Kiss. I'm the primary author of PyCoin, a Python-based crypto coin library. Mostly Bitcoin, but it does support a handful of others, and it's fairly easy to add support for additional coins if uh, anyone's interested in contributing that. So I'll just talk about myself for a little bit because I'm narcissistic. I was born <laughs> in Canada. I grew up and did a lot of hacking on the Apple II. Um, I got published in Nibble Magazine when I was 14 years old. I wrote this thing called the High Res Crunch De Crunch or something. I don't know. Did RLE uh, compression on blackness in Apple II graphics. So very simple stuff, but somehow I managed to write an article and get that published. Um, I studied uh, math in college. Um, then I went to work for Sony Computer Entertainment for about nine months, and that's when I found out I didn't like working for big companies. They relocated to Foster City, and then I worked for a couple startups. Um, most notoriously, this company called Catapult Entertainment. They made this X-Band video game modem. I worked on the Super Nintendo, and uh, my job was reverse engineering Super Nintendo video games and making them work with the modems. So that meant patching the ROM and then, so that instead of reading the controller information locally, the second controller would be read remotely, and then they would exchange the data in from the two games in the sync. Uh, 2400 modem, 2400-baud 2, modem connection. Hmm. So I did that for a few years. I couldn't be really number one anymore. Then I worked for a medical device company for about nine years. And then I worked for a company that uh, my brother started in Vancouver for about nine months. Uh, I've been doing stand-up comedy for about 10 years. And uh, that is going very well. <laughs> but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm taking this very seriously, so please don't expect this to be a comedy presentation because I'll just be disappointed if I accidentally make a joke then you can laugh at that, I suppose. But if you're expecting jokes, then we're just going to be disappointed. So I uh, first came upon uh, Bitcoin with Slash, uh, through Slashdot. I saw a Slashdot article, I think that was, I don't know, 2009, 2010, does anyone remember that article? Oh, nine. Oh, nine? Okay, so I downloaded the software, I read the paper, I didn't understand it. I went the software run overnight, nothing happened. Um, so I forgot about it for like six months to a year, and then like a bad penny Bitcoin keeps coming back in the news. So the next iteration where I hit the news, uh, this time I, I downloaded, I paid closer attention to what was going on, I read the paper more closely. Finally I figured it out, and then like two weeks I was obsessed. Um, <coughs> PyCoin. The, originally, the original genesis of PyCoin was me hacking. Uh, according to Git, I think my first check-in was early June 2011, and I started by just uh, writing some code that would talk to a local Satoshi client. So I actually started with network code, uh, which is probably one of the hardest things. Used the Satoshi client as reference, ported a lot of that code to Python, uh, code that I could understand, I would rewrite. Code that I didn't understand, I would just sort of or straight and leave it be. And then some of it I ended up rewriting later. Um, and I uh, worked on that for a while. <coughs> Stopped working on it about 2012. And about a year later, I came back to it and decided I would come up with something to actually release because Bitcoin was still around. And uh, I think the first release on GitHub was 0.1 in June of 2013. And the focus of PyCoin is essentially, is primarily keys and uh, transactions. And there's a couple of command line tools that do a lot of key and transaction manipulation. There's some extra things in there too, but uh, those are the two main things. So um, I thought I'd focus, uh, just give a demo of a couple of command line. The, there's a couple of major command line tools that are in the library. And so, First off, that's. Okay, uh, can you increase the font size? Yeah, increase the font size. And is it the two, two, six, seven, or is it three? It's a three more. Perfect. And if you can give the repo for those, uh, one of those forms. Yeah, well, this is at GitHub.com. 
Richard Kiss slash High Point Executive. Okay. Uh, so there it is. Saying so a creative virtual environment. I can use Python 3. PyCoin supports uh, Pyth Python 2.7 and above. Uh, it supports Python 3.2 and above. Although I'd recommend using 3.4. for a lot better. It's got this. Uh, the end virtual, virtual end environment thing, which is great. Uh, a lot of people, people familiar with Python in general. What I'm doing here, this is virtual end stuff. So I'm just creating a local Python environment, which has got my command line tools. So the first command line tool is called KU. That's for key utilities. Oh, I forgot to install it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so KU H, it's got a whole lot of help. Uh, essentially, you pass in an item, and an item can be a whole bunch of different things. The simplest thing is, well, uh, let me back up a bit and talk about how Bitcoin keys work and the uh, cryptography behind it. The, the, crypto, the cryptographical scheme used is called ECDSA, elliptical curve, digital signature algorithm, I believe it stands for. And uh, it's got a private key and a public key. The private key is usually is also called the secret exponent, and it's just a number between one and a really big number, which is a little bit smaller than 2 to the power 256. So this is the very first, this is the representation of the very first secret key, one. It's the exponent one. This is the corresponding width in both uh, compressed and uncompressed form. Now the uh, public key that corresponds to this width is actually a pair of numbers, an x and a y coordinate. Here's the x coordinate in decimal, and here's the y coordinate in decimal. This is why I didn't want to make, the, make it too big, because now it's wrapping around my uh, small way to make it for to not wrap. Make it pretty small. Anybody bring glasses? Anybody bring enough glasses for everyone? <laughs> Is that legible? Too small? I really have to go one smaller and make it more round. Right? So these are the x and y coordinates in hex. Uh, for a given x coordinate, there are two possible y coordinates. But they have opposite parity. There's an even y coordinate and an odd y coordinate. So uh, we also print out the parity, which you can just tell it's even. But why not print it up? Uh, then the uh, key pair can be represented as this format called SEC, which I think stand is the standards for security code. No, not that. It's, it's a different one. Uh, I don't know, some, some cryptographic standards body. Uh, anyway, this format for the public key is actually used in the blockchain. So that's why it's important. And there are two ways to store the SEC. Uh, prefixing it with a 0, 2, or 0, 3, depending on whether the Y coordinate is even or odd. Or prefixing it with 0, 4. And then you've got the X coordinate, which is here. You can see that it matches this and the y coordinate, which is there. See, it matches that. And then you take the SEC, you take the hash 160, which is the SHA 256 hash, and then rip MD 160 hash, so you get a 20-bit, 160-bit, uh, 20-byte number. So this is the hash of that, and this is the hash of that, and this is used to derive the address. And this is used to derive the uncompressed address. So as you move down, information is lost. When you go from uh, here to here, 
that, those are equivalent. But once you get down to the public pair, there's no way to go back up to get the secret exponent. That's the, that's the trick. If you could, then, well, a lot of Bitcoins would be missing. <laughs> so KU uh, takes any of these values as inputs. This will print, this will print exactly the same thing. You can see it's the same. Uh, or you can use the uncompressed. It's going to be the same output. Because these just correspond to the secret exponent one. But once you get down to here, you can actually see what address corresponds to this, this xy pair. And uh, you can see this number appears in the list. And this is the same address, the same pair of addresses that appear above, but you don't get the width, obviously. KU will also let you use the hex values, same output. So it's really sort of a tool for people who are debugging low level stuff. Same values and getting a lot of mail. Or you can input the SEC, make it the same thing or the long form of the SEC, which require two copies and pastes, same thing. Uh, but going from the SEC to the hash, if you pass in the hash, and KU determines it just because everything happens to have a different length. All you get out is the address. You can't work your way back up to the SEC, and there's no way to know whether this address is a compressed address or an uncompressed address. These are the three main components of a, of a width. You've got the width, the public pair, which is the public key, and then the Bitcoin address. People generally only see the Bitcoin address and the width. Now there's also this standard called uh, BIP32, Bitcoin Improvement Protocol 32, which defines a hierarchy of keys, uh, a deterministic hierarchy of keys. I think Electrum was the first wallet that I'm aware of that supported hierarchical uh, deterministic keys, uh, although Electrum only officially supports one level of hierarchy. So with Electrum, uh, well, look, let me uh, talk about what Satoshi Client does. Every time you need a new address, um, it just generates it randomly. So it generates a pool of 100 addresses on first launch. And once you exhaust those, it generates 100 more, which means you've got to continuously back up your wallet because if you make a backup of your wallet and then it generates 100 more and then you lose uh, your wallet, your backup only has the secret keys to the first 100 that you backed up. And that's a problem. So what Electrum does is it comes up with a single C and there's a deterministic way to generate as many addresses as you need from that one C. BIP32 is a generalization of this where you have a node which is called a BIP32 node, and you can generate as many nodes as you want under me. I think like 2 billion, which for me, I call that as many as I want. And in each of those, you can generate 2 billion under those, and so on, down to I think like 256 levels. So it's not infinite, but it's close enough. Uh, because when you raise 2 billion to the power of 256, it gets bigger in a hurry. Now, each of these nodes has a width associated with it, and so it also has a public pair and an address associated with it. There is a standard on how to generate a node uh, using a password, so KU supports doing that, and I'm going to pass in the password foo. And here is the, uh, here's the width that corresponds to the, to the node at the top of the tree, that is password foo. Uh, it also declares a couple new types, which you may not have seen. Wallet keys. This is a private wallet key. This, this is sort of the analog to the width for that node. With this text, you can recreate this node and recreate any of the child nodes, as long as you know the path to it. There's also a public version, which lets you create the addresses that correspond to the widths, but not the widths. So you can give this out 
and rest assured that people aren't going to be able to steal your coins, just generate addresses that they can send money to. So a typical use case for this is if you have a web server and you want to generate invoices and generate a unique address for each invoice, you can put this, this key on your web server, generate all the invoices you want, watch to see if payments are made to these addresses, and not have to worry about hackers breaking in. If they break in and get this value, all they can do is send you money. They can't steal money. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Sorry, good question. Is the yes. input, is that just like, do you hash it to get some of the numbers, or do you have some of the key variation on the Oh, you mean this? The, yeah, the food. The well, food. How does food connect to the well, The BIP32 defines a standard on how to turn a text password, well, a binary password, into this. So it's actually, I actually wouldn't recommend it because <laughs> this is the same problem as Brain Wallet. The, I think it's just a, a SHA 256 hash, which means of all hashes to use, they use the one where there is so much hardware out there that they're generating <laughs> billions of keys every second. Um, so KU actually has another mode, uh, KU Create, where it uses dev random and GPG to create entropy, and then you can rest assured that this has probably never been generated by anyone. Uh, I have a question. Yes. How many, how many bits of entropy does it generate? The uh, KU? I think they get 64 from each of uh, GPG and dev random. And one's one missing. each? Yeah, from each. Sorry. So it's overkill. There's 64 bytes, rather. Right? So if one doesn't exist, then you still have enough because uh, the hash that BIP32 uses is actually SHA512 because every node has a width, but it also has this thing called a chain code, which is used to provide extra ent entropy to feed back in uh, to get to the next level. So question, could I use KU to the dictionary words, in a bunch of widths, and then just see if there's... And see if there's money? <laughs> sure. Knock yourself up. But my guess is that you're not the first person to you yeah. who's done that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have another question on that same line. Uh, for for a set of keys, doesn't the 32 require an extra two or four digits of entropy? Uh, yeah, well, I was, I was talking in bytes. Oh, bytes. Okay, so that's a bit more. Yeah, 64 bytes for each from DevRam and, and yeah. GPG. So if I misspoke, I apologize. Okay, so uh, now KU will also limit the output so it's a little more uh, palatable. Sorry, it's dash W. That's the, uh, the width that corresponds to that node. That's the BIP32 key that corresponds to that node. So you can actually just feed in the BIP32 key directly. And you see that's the same as that. Uh, you can also get just the address. In the case of this, because it's easier to figure what's going on. And here's the uncompressed address. Uh, you can use KU to generate uh, child nodes. So uh, S stands for subpath. So you got your node at the top, and then the the, ch the zeroth child subnode. That is this one. And you can see the tree depth is now one instead of zero. The parent fingerprint is uh, the same. It's actually this parent fingerprint maps to the fingerprint of the original key. Uh, the child index is included. The, all this all this stuff is uh, actually included in here. Um, so we can generate just the address. You can see that's the same as that. Or the uncompressed address. You can see that's the same as that. Uh, here's another child node. There's the width. 
there's the BIP32 key, there's the address, there's the uncompressed address, there's the uncompressed width. I'm sorry. I get W and W mixed up. And you can also generate a range of nodes. More interesting. So there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Here are the corresponding BIP32 nodes. Here are the corresponding widths. So you can see that the address corresponding to that is up here. Does this make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> Now here's, a, here's the uh, public version of this key. You can see there's the XPUB, there's no PRV anywhere. Do a cup of coffee. So here, so here are the first five addresses that you try and generate the whiffs. Well, okay, you can generate the BIP32 nodes, but it gives you just the public versions. Try and generate the whiffs and it doesn't work, it's not a good error message. So you can see this matches that. But there's no way to go back up to the private key. Now there is a there is a gotcha. And that's if you have a uh, if you give out a public key up here and a private key that's down here. Uh, to the same person, they can actually work their way back up the tree to, re to reverse engineer the private key that you gave out. So there's this mechanism called hardening, which prevents that. You're saying if you give a uh, public key out from like uh, tier tier one and a private key from a sub tier, is that what you're saying? Yes. If okay. you give out, so here's here's the uh, specific example. Dash P. So if you give this out, and then you give a child out, the private version, you can actually take this and work your way back up the tree and get the private yep. version for that. So that's a nasty gotcha. So they also invented this mechanism called hardened keys, uh, where you can only generate it from the private key. So you can see that if you add an H, that means I don't want the zeroth key, I want the zeroth hardened key. And it's completely different. And it gives you completely different you know, whiffs, completely different addresses. And there's no way to go back up the tree. Uh, but that also means that you can't, that another consequence is you can't, uh, you can traverse down the tree through hardened nodes with the private key, but not with a public key. So uh, let me generate a public version of this. see that uh, this matches that. To do that, it's much easier to see. All right, let me start again. Here's the zeroth child. And here's getting there the other way. Yes, W.
All right, so that's clear from what I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? Like, what, what could we not get from the hardened key? Yeah, so what's the limitation of the hardened key that you were trying to... Uh, uh, so if you if you want to take a path that goes through a hardened key, you have to do it from a private key. You can't do it from a public key because it needs... So hardened keys report... Uh, I think the idea of hardened keys is you put your change into a hardened key. Mm -hmm. Because you want to give out your, you can give out your public key to someone so they can send you money, but you don't want them to see where you're sending change to later. Mm -hmm. So you need the private key, you turn it the hard key, and then you, you send the change. To that. So that's what I that's what I use when I when I just okay yeah so far so good. Okay. Why would you ever use a non-hardened key? Because uh, <coughs> you might want to give out a public key to an auditor and allow them to see a bunch of children. Ah. Because uh, can a typical it. hierarchy you might do is like one person creates a key and then they create a sub key which is business, a sub key which is personal, and then LLC one, LLC two, LLC three, uh, you know, um, spending money. Can 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 stuff be further derived from hardened keys? Yes. Okay. So they're just they're just notes themselves. Okay. And you can you can traverse the paths can be traversed you know more than one level. Like uh, here's KU equaling subpath zero and then four and eighteen. Uh, or here's the three addresses down several levels. You can put a hardened node somewhere in the middle. But if I try and make it public for uh, public first, the, oh, I guess the public app at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if I try and go down the path through a hardened key with uh -huh. this, it's going to fail because that's all. This is a public key. So it's hard to derive stuff from the public keys of hardened. Public keys can't go through a hardened node, okay. a hardened path. Okay. So if I start with a like the level level zero public key, okay. I can go down as many nodes until I reach the hardened key, then I can't do anything. So if I start with level zero and level one, like level two, but if level three is hardened, then I can't go any further. If you if you have a public key, you can't. If you have a private key, you can. So it's like it's almost like there's two parallel trees. Right? The private key, which you can go through any node. And the public key, which has got some of the information that's in the, in the private tree, you can't go through any of the hardened nodes. But as long as the, the intermediate levels are not hardened, it can go down until it reaches the hardened. Right. Uh, so, um, what else we got? KU has a few other features. Output is JSON. So there's JSON output, this is the same information, it's just a little parse connected to submit this as a patch. Uh, supports other networks. So there's Bitcoin, there's a testnet. Uh, Litecoin. So you can see the apps are different. Other than Litecoin. Pardon me? Have you had pull requests for other support than Litecoin? Uh, yeah. Dodge, I think. Blackcoin. Yeah, Blackcoin. Yeah, Blackcoin. I don't even know what prefix it uses. It's a B, apparently. And the width starts with a P or a 6. So KU is smart enough to, if you pass in a 6, it knows that it's a Blackcoin. Address. So it prints up the prints up the address using black coin in the picture. That uh, does it do bit thirty eight encrypted wallets. Bit thirty eight. Bit thirty eight. No, there's no support for that. Yet. Uh, one of the goals of Pi, or one of the goals of Pi coin was to be a completely self-contained pure Python library. So bit thirty eight would be pretty slow. I mean, it would be doable, but unless you want to import a C library, it would be kind of useless. And, uh, I haven't gotten around to it. But if you want to work on that, okay. <laughs>
Okay, so that's uh, KU. Now the other uh, the other uh, big tool is called TX for transaction manipulation. What's that? You need more. Yeah, there's more. Mm -hmm. What time is it? Oh, you got more time. Oh, okay. You got any more patience? <laughs> uh, so TX dash H. Here's the output. This is another sort of generic tool where you can pass in all kinds of uh, all kinds of crap. Um, it's a it's a very general tool. It'll let you create transactions with a lock time. I don't know if you know lock time is a, most of the time the lock time is zero, which means the transaction is always valid. But you can specify a minimum block number, which means the transaction can't be included in a block that's smaller than this, or a time, which means the transaction can't be included in a block that's timestamp earlier than this. Um, you can specify the network. Uh, TX also has some uh, support for pulling data from the internet. Uh, perhaps you've heard of that. Oh God, I can't think of that. Copies. So just to be clear, you wrote this all yourself? Uh, mostly, I got some polls from for bugs from various other people, but I'd say probably 95% myself. Okay, so one thing that TX will do is it will query uh, <coughs> web services to get transactions. And you have to specify that you actually want to do that which service providers you're allowing. So if you run it and you haven't specified that, it yells at you and tells you to set some environment variables, which I'm doing now. So now, when I run it, it's going to check blockchain info. If that, just, if that comes up empty, it'll try block, block or IO. It checks them in this order. Block explorer, bit easy. So this is the uh, famous pizza transaction. Uh, and this is the format that TX uses to display the transactions. The version number, the hash of the transaction, the size, the, uh, the input count, the output count, the lock time, and if it's not zero, it, it, it turns into either a block number or a time. And more information about the inputs. It's an unknown input. And information about the outputs. 10,000 bitcoins to uh, this guy who turned around and spent it, turns out. It also dumps the transaction in hex. Um, now, it doesn't validate, it's, it's not validating the transaction, the transaction because uh, I haven't instructed it to download the source transaction, but you can actually do that by adding a dash A, and now it will get all the source transactions and validate to check the signature. In this case, the signature is okay. What do you define as all? Pardon me? What do you define as all? Uh, like how far back? Like just one level back? Just one level back. Okay. Yeah, that's all you need to check the signature. Okay. You just, yes? Where is the library getting all the information? Is it communicating with the Bitcoin network or is it then have the copy of the blockchain? Oh, uh, yeah, it's getting it from these guys. So there's, there's a services. Yeah, somewhere. Okay, yo, BT, okay, I see now. Blockchain in full. Okay, okay. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. Is, is there a reason you didn't connect to like Electrum servers, or is it just too much work? Um, I haven't looked into that yet. I mean, I guess I have looked at the Electrum server code a little bit, but decided I had other things to do. Um, so it turns out that a fair amount of Bitcoin has actually been sent to this address corresponds to the secret exponent one. So uh, in particular, there's a transaction ID. I don't feel like typing 64 characters. So TX, if you pass in dash U, it gives you a list of unspent or of uh, outputs for transactions using this text format. Yeah, so this is this is a particular transaction where someone sent money to this address that we happen to know the secret exponent for. Uh, you'll notice that this hash 160 
Hash 160 actually appears in the output script. So this is the transaction ID, this is the index, this is the output script, and this is the quantity in Satoshi's. So TX actually recognizes this for tuple as what I call a spendable. You can take this spendable and write a transaction that actually sends it somewhere, so I'm going to send it to myself. So this is an unsigned transaction. <coughs> so you can see it's taking all these coins, uh, it's using a default fee, and sending all but the fee, the value of the fee to this address, which is uh, one of my vanity addresses. Uh, but you also see that it's got a bad signature because I didn't tell TX how to sign it. Well, KU dash one dash W W. You get that mixed up with stock TXT. So I'll create a text file with the requisite width, pass it into TX, TX stock text of TX dot sign dot out. And it actually signs it. And there it is. So this is a signed transaction that transfers these uh, 23 millibit coins that worth like 70 bucks to my address. And then there's the hex. So Take that hex and paste it into a blockchain info. <coughs> well, actually, let's decode the transaction first. So, I don't know if you can see this. So, you can see this looks a lot like, uh, well, not a lot, <laughs> not so much like it, but it's got a lot of the same information that's in here. There's the hash, the transaction. There's the address, there's the value. So it looks like a legitimate transaction. Uh, now it's actually pasted in, submit it, broadcast it to the network. Hmm. And we get an error because someone, someone beat me to it. Hmm. But anyway, this shows that uh, TX will actually sign transactions, uh, given a list of widths. You can also use GPG to encode your WIFs. <coughs> and uh, it automatically recognizes that it's a GPG file and you can enter my passphrase and then <coughs> sign the transaction with that, which means you can leave your WIFs encrypted using GPG, you never have to decrypt them even to a RAM disk. So it's, uh, using these command line tools, it's a pretty complete solution. You can also do this offline in a cold storage mechanism. Create the unsigned transaction, put it onto a USB key, bring it to your cold storage machine, sign it, and bring it back and transmit it. Can you transmit it to the testnet too? Or uh, well, I'm just using blockchain info. I don't think they support testnet. So does TX have the ability to broadcast a transaction through the same? TX does case? not. There's the only uh, network support that Pycoin has is talking to the web services. Actually, I think there might be. Uh, <coughs> there I guess there is some code in there for that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not just called send TX. They just pass the TX system. What's that? So it does does it do it for you? Well, I have it in code, but I don't think there's any uh, command line uh, interface to it. Uh, project. What's that? Something. Yeah. <laughs> Something to do.
Uh, now, transactions are signed using this, this new deterministic method for determining K. This is, there's this whole uh, discussion about uh, when you sign a transaction, you have to generate a random number first. It's called K. And if you choose K poorly, or you sign two transactions with the same K value, then you can reveal your secret key. So someone came up with a, a deterministic way to generate this K. And uh, PyCoin is using that mechanism now, which means that it, it's also helpful for test cases because you can generate transactions and run it against the test case because you don't, the transaction will have a known hash. Um, TX also supports partial signatures for uh, multi-sig transactions. So you could create an unsigned transaction, send it to Joe, who's, who, uh, uh, with the uh, multi-sig inputs, send it to Joe, who signs his part, send it to Mary, who signs her part, and then broadcast it. So it could be used for like a <coughs> coin join type thing. Uh, So other uh, features of PyCoin worth talking about is uh, easy to add networks. This is the uh, networks file. So just a little metadata about each network, Bitcoin, mainnet, the code for it, the prefix for, uh, for widths, the prefix for addresses, the prefix is for pay to script, that is addresses that start with free. The uh, prefix for the BIP32 um, wallets, so it's XPRV for Bitcoin and XPUV for uh, Bitcoin public. Testnet uses uh, XTN, it's got a, it's different, uh, Litecoin, Dogecoin. Uh, I think I just copied some of these values from Bitcoin. So adding <coughs> networks generally just means changing this, although uh, TX is not going to work for networks that add inference. Um, I, got, I think Blackcoin, the TX, is, looks slightly different than Bitcoin. Is it a, is a proof of stake? Yes. So uh, TX doesn't support proof of stake currencies yet, although I do have patches for that. Uh, it's easy to add new experimental script types. So this is a script multi-sig. There, there's a base script type, which needs to conform to a certain interface. You need a from script method, and it'll take a compiled script and try and match it to this type. So you pass in a compiled script, and if it's not a script multi-sig, it just raises a value error. Uh, you need to implement solve, because the way you generate solution script to a multi-sig input is very different from how you generate a solution script to a, a typical transaction. Uh, so it supports multi-sig, pay to address, which is a typical transaction. 99% of the Bitcoin transactions are pay to addresses. It supports pay to public key. This is generally used in the first transaction in a block, the, the reward transaction. For some reason, it's a different format. There's really no reason it needs to be, but it usually is. And this includes the, pub, the entire public key rather than the hash of the public key. Uh, supports pay to script, which is different from pay to multi-sig. You can have a, a multi-sig input that actually lists out the addresses the addresses that need to, to correspond to the WIFs that you require to sign that portion of the multi-sig. So this is not that well understood. I just figured it out myself recently. And here's the base script type. And then it, everything else just is an unknown script where there's really very little metadata. But like, for example, if you want to TX to be able to parse off return outputs, then you just create a script off return and uh, come up with a way to, to identify that and parse it. Yes? Can you give a script like a data with address? Uh, so I think TX might support that. Awesome. So you just sort of drop in and 
this from scratch instead of like regular Well, you'd have to turn it into the 3x. So K, KU doesn't support 3x addresses, but TX might. I don't remember. If not, it's, it's definitely close to being done. Uh, <coughs> also, I have an uh, electron deterministic key generation working, but uh, that's not get up yet coming soon. And there is a file called txutils, which makes it pretty easy to create new transactions. This one's actually well documented. It doesn't even use the SPY, is that what it's called? SPV. SPV. 
SP what? SPV. SPV, yeah. Uh, so I figure <coughs> my estimates are is that you could just run this thing once a week and it would catch up a week's worth of blocks in just a couple minutes. Um, I have a for this. Home not set. Boy, that is an empty environment. So it's connecting to uh, eight different clients, and it's downloading headers. It queues up the headers and uh, pulls out headers, and, and you can see that it's downloading block headers and then blocks. And uh, it's, iter it's actually iterating through the transactions in real time, looking for ones that are of interest to my watch wallet. goes up to about 200, 300 megabytes of RAM, but you can shrink that. Because uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of pipelining. I think I, I load 400 uh, headers. That's just a bug, ignore that. Uh, 400 headers before, uh, uh, well, it's fetching blocks in parallel. So it's like, I want to get the next 400 <coughs> blocks. So it, it tries to fetch them from various clients. Uh, but you have to process them in order, which means that if you get the blocks, you sort of have to rearrange them in, in, into the correct sequence. That's, that's what can use memory. So if you put a maximum on how many blocks you want to fit pre finished that tricks the memory requirements. When you, uh, when you say you only want to update it once, uh, once a week, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the disk is, what was it, 10 megabytes or something? Uh, yeah, well, instead of like 13 gigabytes of blockchain info, that's essentially summarized in about 10 megabytes. You do need to keep around the last few blocks in case there's a rewind, uh, but I haven't worked through the details on how it's going to work. So I imagine probably about a dozen, two dozen blocks. What's the biggest rewind that's ever been done? I think it's 50. 50? 50? Yeah. <laughs> Less uh, less free. Oh wow, that for it seems like a large. It was a bit deep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Was, was that the database <laughs> for? Yeah, it was. Uh. Uh, does this pull the headers from the Bitcoin network or from other uh, services like blockchain or info? No, this isn't using any services. So okay. this is just talking to regular clients. Uh -huh. I mean peers. Peers, yeah. So mostly Satoshi clients. Uh, I have this running in production for uh, one person who <coughs> used to look for deposits. Oh, I mean, not this exact code, but a variation of it that uses async IF. It's, it's really hacky, but we kill it every hour, but it seems to work. So it's a, it's a way to watch for deposits without letting anyone know that you're interested in what's that? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Is it validating these are all valid block headers itself? Or is it just trusting the nodes to provide only valid block headers? Um, it's not doing any validation, but really I think the only validation you need is to check that the block headers meet the difficulty that they claim to, because that's pretty hard to forge and pretty useless to forge. 
So yeah, so it's not it's it's not checking the transactions. <coughs> it can't because it doesn't have a, a database of spendables to validate against that. There's a lot more disk space. Anyway, so that's the uh, what's going on with PyCoin Net, and this PyCoin Net is also on GitHub <coughs> the repository, but it's pretty far from where I've been working on it because it's under such heavy development that it's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> What kind of uh, help are you looking for um, with PyCoin and PyCoin Net right now? Uh, I've looked into uh, actually documenting PyCoin a little better, maybe just putting on uh, read the docs. Uh, I've been using Travis continuous integration and talks for testing, so uh, test cases is definitely something that people could easily get involved in. Uh, um, there, there are some outstanding bugs on, on GitHub. I've got some pull requests that I haven't figured out how to integrate properly, like a black coin which require the, requires some C libraries, and I don't know exactly what to do about that. Because I, you know, I want to make it more flexible, but I don't want to require anything other than my phone, at least for use cases where it's not necessary. <coughs> Any more questions? One last question. Is there anywhere um, other than this video where you have like a step right down? Steps <coughs> uh, is that you well, there is a uh, yeah. So which one? <laughs> this talk was mostly based on a document in the repository called uh, Command Line Tools. So this has got a lot of. This is based on a blog post that I wrote. It's got a lot of information about how to use KU or example cases. Where, where is that? that uh, GitHub Richard Kiss Python. Uh-huh. Oh, command line tools MD. Yeah. I see. Okay. Just to be clear, is this principally a command line tool, or can we actually import this into our Python projects and get going? The command line tools don't have uh, much code in them. They're mostly just calling into PyCoin, so they could Okay. Sort of you know, provide a, a, a sample code and how to use it. <clears throat> and uh, I tried to make the code really clear and reasonably well documented. Some parts of it are still a bit mysterious. That's where you get How does this compare to Pi Bitcoin tools like Vitalik's uh, CLI, right? Yeah. His is a lot smaller. It's a lot simpler. I don't. Um, it probably supports a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, I know he supports about 32 in Electrum. Uh, this has got some classes in it, okay. like, uh, parsing transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he supports multi-seek. He might. Uh, this also has got the complete VM in it. I'm pretty sure it doesn't have okay. that. I don't think he looks for the block headers. That was very. Really Unique for sure. Sorry? The block headers, connecting to the peers and looking for the block headers. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's in like point net. So his, his library is probably a lot, it's probably best compared to PyCoin. Okay. I separated out PyCoin net because I wanted to keep PyCoin working in the two seconds. PyCoin net never will. Oh, okay. Because the dependency on async.io, I thought three, three, or one.